like uh, the rest of tonight's speakers, I'll be presenting a fundamental engineering problem with broad societal impact. Um, my preferred title was compression driven displacement flows, but it could just as easily be called uh, why does ketchup splatter and uh, why does that matter? <laughs> Two questions which I've been thinking a lot about with my colleague Chris. So this is an engineering problem. We have an elastic walled vessel which we are compressing to produce a stream of fluid, the ketchup. Um, the design criterion is that we want to produce a nice steady stream, but all too often that can turn into an abrupt splatter. Can we find ways to control this? Um, I believe that the answer to that question lies in my chosen field of research, which is flow of liquids through porous materials. It's a very broad topic. It does include ketchup splatter, but also um, how we can capture carbon dioxide underground in aquifers rather than releasing it into the atmosphere. Um, how hydrogen bubbles move around inside fuel cells. Um, why different types of volcanoes erupt in different ways, and even how to reinflate flat airways in the lungs. So once we've chosen a research question, I then go off to the lab and experiment with porous materials like sponges. This is from my colleague Matilda made out of silicon. Um, that lets us look at how liquid moves around in this network of pores or tubes inside the material. We're quite often interested in how liquid moves through just one of those pores, um, which is a bit like how liquid moves through a tube or the nozzle of a ketchup bottle. Um, once we've um, done all this experimenting, that hopefully leads us on to developing new theories or new equations like this one. Um, I'd like to pause a moment because this equation is one of mine and it's currently the crowning achievement in my research career. Um, it's a compact and elegant statement that contains um, something fundamental about all of these other complex physical problems. So, um, why have I been talking about ketchup at all? Um, well, for me, the perfect analogy to explain what this equation tells us is ketchup splatter. So, let's take a deep scientific dive into exactly that. Uh, right, forces. I'm a physicist, so I like to think first off about forces, what's driving the flow, what's resisting the flow, how do those things balance. And the key here is that when you get towards the end of the bottle, which is when splatter is most likely, most of what you have left is air. So that's been drawn back in after each time you squeeze. And so now when you squeeze, what you're really doing is compressing the air inside. The air compresses much like a spring and wants to return to its natural volume. The easiest way for it to expand, therefore, is to push ketchup out through the nozzle. So that's the driving force. Um, the ketchup then has to squeeze through that narrow nozzle. There's a resistance associated with that. Uh, we call it viscous drag. It's essentially a form of friction that stops the uh, ketchup sliding easily past the walls of the container or through the nozzle. So the equation I showed tells us that the speed at which the ketchup comes out is determined by a balance between the driving force and the resistance, which um, we need to think carefully about when that balance goes wrong if we want to understand the splatter. Right, so we've got a rough theory now, we can do some experiments. So um, what I've done is taken the same syringe six times over, mounted it in a type of pump, um, it's basically like a um, scientific bike pump, Tristan scaled up, I scaled down, um, and it lets us squeeze in a very controlled way just by bringing the plunger down at a fixed speed. The only thing that I've changed um, is from left to right, I'm starting each time with slightly more air in the syringe. So the scientific question is, okay, if the compressed air is what's driving the flow, then does the amount of air matter? That's the only thing that changed. So hopefully, wonderful. Right, when the video plays, you'll see ketchup falling into the screen because we're looking top down. It's a bit unnerving, but here we go. So the pump starts running and you get ketchup dispensed in a nice smooth way to begin with until that, that, and that happens. Scientific confirmation of ketchup splatter. <laughs> but only for these four, right? But there's enough uh, air. For these two on the left, all the ketchup is squeezed out in a nice smooth flow without even any sign of splatter. So we can draw a conclusion from that. Yes, the amount of air matters, and it matters in a very systematic way. It's an either or thing. If there's enough air, you get splatter. Not enough air, no splatter at all, nothing in between. So in other words, there's, uh, there's a threshold, in this case a critical amount of air, where you go from one scenario to the next. So can we understand that threshold? So the real experiments we did looked similar to what you just saw, but we simplified. So the, the first simplification to make is to just get rid of the ketchup. It's actually a very complicated liquid. 
Um, anyone who's seen people running on uh, vats of ke uh, custard, sorry, um, ketchup is another kind of non-Newtonian fluid. You can't walk on it, um, but it's weird for its own reasons. So we put that to one side and we used a type of mineral oil, which is much better behaved, easier to study. Um, and we pushed that out of a tube, so that just has a nice uniform shape all the way along, so we have a simple geometry. And all that um, effort to simplify meant we could write down this nice crisp equation, which will tell us why ketchup splatters and why there's a threshold. Before I get to that, I would like to stress, um, partly just my own ego really, that even though this looks like a simple problem, it's actually inherently complex. The reason for that is because the compressed air driving force and the resistance in the oil um, are both inherently tangled together, and they both change moment by moment. So to understand that, we kind of have to untangle all of that and just look at it in a step-by-step -step timeline. So the first thing to think about happening is that the pump switch is on and that compresses the air. The air wants to expand and so the driving force rises. The driving force rises and that means that the oil gets pushed out. The less oil there is to push, the easier it is to push. So there's less resistance that falls. There's a second consequence to the oil leaving the tube, however, which is that it makes space for the air to expand into, which is what the air wants to do. So the air can relax and our driving force falls. So we now have both resistance and driving force falling. We need to think about what happens when the very last drop of oil is pushed out. Because at that point, there's nothing to push, so the resistance vanishes. As I said before, the speed of this flow, whether it's uh, oil from a tube or ketchup from a bottle or lava from a volcano event, that depends on a balance between the driving force and the resistance. So we're now trying to balance something against nothing. The only way that works is if the driving force disappears as well. That means we maintain a balance and a nice smooth flow, or in other words, the air expands and relaxes perfectly just at the instant that all the oil leaves the tube. That can happen. There's a second possibility, which is that the air remains compressed when the last drop of oil leaves the tube. So you end up with a pent-up force that um, is now something trying to balance against nothing that doesn't work and all of that pent up force is released with the last drop of oil being splattered out. What the equation tells us is that there is a threshold between those two scenarios which is exactly what we saw here. We've tipped over the threshold, we've had too much air because when you have more air it's easier to compress so it's easier to end up with a pent up force which is suddenly released as a splatter. When there's not enough air, you stay below the threshold, everything stays in balance, and you get a nice smooth flow. So um, back to the engineering problem, how do we avoid splatter? Well, the answer is, of course, to stay below the threshold. Um, the threshold depends on a lot of factors, so it has lots of practical advice. You can squeeze slower, right? that should help. Uh, remove the cap, so a narrower nozzle means that uh, there's more resistance, that tends to tip you over the threshold. You take the cap off, larger spout squeeze for it, perfect. Uh, avoid valves, this is a good one. So you know the rubber valves you get on the end of some caps? But yeah, um, so great for lots of other reasons, I'm not discrediting them, but for splatter they make you pre-compress before anything comes out, which is just asking for trouble. Um, so that's all kind of common sense with a rigorous mathematical framework, which I think is great. But what if we extend these ideas to our other, more complex problems? Do you get splatter elsewhere? So in the lungs, when they're collapsed and people pump in air, deep down in the lungs, um, so uh, um, there's a very nice demonstration of this coming up, but unfortunately you're just going to have to take my word for it for now. There's some very narrow airways that are, can be occluded with uh, mucus. The air has to push that mucus out of the way. And if that mucus um, splatters, essentially, then there's a sudden release of force which puts stress on a tissue and can kill cells. In volcanoes, gases escape by pushing uh, magma out of the way. That can escape in a sort of gentle way, or it can be an explosive eruption, so volcanoes splatter. Um, carbon dioxide, when it's pumped underground into aquifers, has to push water out of the way between all the grains, oh, wait, sorry, grains of rock. Um, and each time that happens on that microscopic scale, you can get the equivalent of splatter. Um, and things that happen on that microscopic scale change how CO2 moves over many kilometers, so it's important to understand. Finally, uh, hydrogen, a promising um, option for storing renewable energy. Um, the bubbles of it can um, become trapped and clog up fuel cells, reducing how efficient they are. Something very similar to splatter um, changes how quickly that happens.
So understanding the humble ketchup bottle and this equation doesn't just tell us that you can get splatter in these situations, it tells you that there is a threshold, which means that you don't have to get splatter. So if you want to avoid it, you can extend this theory to these more complex situations, find where the threshold is, design ways to avoid it, predict when it will happen, and understand the consequences of it better. So that was all kind of um, a bit of a whistle-stop tour through that research. Um, if anyone wants further details, uh, we've, we've got a peer-reviewed paper that I'd recommend for males write up. Um, <laughs> on, no, partly just from a spirited discussion. Uh, it's you know, generated quite a bit, feel free to join. I am pleased to say that my work has finally been recognised as a complete and utter waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.